The Sack Maneater by Jim Corbett. Peace had reigned in the Ladia Valley for many months when, in September 38, a report was received in Naini Tal that a girl 12 years of age had been killed by a tiger at Kotkindri village. The report, which reached me through Donald Stewart of the Forest Department, gave no details, and it was not until I visited the village some weeks later that I was able to get particulars of the tragedy. It appeared that, about noon one day, this girl was picking up windfalls from a mango tree close to and in full view of the village, when a tiger suddenly appeared. Before the men working nearby were able to render any assistance, it carried her off. No attempt was made to follow up the tiger, and as all signs of drag and blood trail had been obliterated and washed away long before I arrived on the scene, I was unable to find the place where the tiger had taken the body to. Kotkindri is about four miles southwest of Chuka, and three miles due west of Thak. It was in the valley between Kotkindri and Thak that the Chuka man-eater had been shot the previous April. My most direct route to Kotkindri was to go by rail to Tanakpur, and from there by foot via Kaldunga and Chuka. This route, however, though it would save me a hundred miles of walking, would necessitate my passing through the most deadly malaria belt in northern India, and to avoid it, I decided to go through the hills to Mornala, and from there along the abandoned Shering Road to its termination on the ridge above Kotkindri. While my preparations for this long trek were still underway, a second report reached Nainital of a kill at Sem, a small village on the left bank of the Ladia, and distant about half a mile from Chuka. The victim on this occasion was an elderly woman, the mother of the headman of Sem. This unfortunate woman had been killed while cutting brushwood on a steep bank between two terraced fields. She had started work at the further end of the fifty-yard-long bank, and had cut the brushwood to within a yard of her hut when the tiger sprang on her from the field above. So sudden and unexpected was the attack that the woman only had time to scream once before the tiger killed her, and taking her up the twelve-foot-high bank, crossed the upper field and disappeared with her into the dense jungle beyond. Her son, a lad some twenty years of age, was at the time working in a paddy field a few yards away and witnessed the whole occurrence, but was too frightened to try to render any assistance. In response to the lad's urgent summons, the Patwari arrived at Sem two days later, accompanied by eighty men he had collected. Following up in the direction the tiger had gone, he found the woman's clothes and a few small bits of bone. This kill had taken place at 2 p.m. on a bright sunny day, and the tiger had eaten its mum only 60 yards from the hut where it had killed her. On receipt of this second report, Ibbotson, deputy commissioner of the three districts of Almorda, Nainital, and Gatwal, and I held a council of war, the upshot of which was that Ibbotson, who was on the point of setting out to settle a land dispute at Ascot, on the border of Tibet, changed his tour program, and, instead of going via Bageshwar, decided to accompany me to Sem, and from there go on to Ascot. The route I had selected entailed a considerable amount of hill climbing, so we eventually decided to go up the Nandaur Valley, cross the watershed between the Nandaur and Ladia, and follow the latter river down to Sem. The Ibbotsons accordingly left Nainital on October 12th, and the following day I joined them at Chorgalia. Going up the Nandaur and fishing as we went, our best day's catch on light trout rods was 120 fish, we arrived on the fifth day at Durga Pepal. Here we left the river, and after a very stiff climb, camped for the night on the watershed. Making an early start next morning, we pitched our tents that night on the left bank of the Ladia, twelve miles from Chalti. The monsoon had given over early, which was very fortunate for us, for owing to the rock cliffs that run sheer down into the valley, the river has to be crossed every quarter of a mile or so. At one of these fords, my cook, who stands five feet in his boots, was washed away, 
and only saved from a watery grave by the prompt assistance of the man who was carrying our lunch basket. On the tenth day, after leaving Chogalia, we made camp on a deserted field at Sem, two hundred yards from the hut where the woman had been killed, and a hundred yards from the junction of the Ladia and Sarda rivers. Gil Waddell, of the police, whom we met on our way down the Ladia, had camped for several days at Sem, and had tied out a buffalo that MacDonald, of the forest department, had very kindly placed at our disposal. And though the tiger had visited Sem several times during Waddell's stay, it had not killed the buffalo. The day following our arrival at Sem, while Ibbotson was interviewing Patwaris, forest guards, and headmen of the surrounding villages, I went out to look for pug marks. Between our camp and the junction, and also on both banks of the Ladia, there were long stretches of sand. On this sand I found the tracks of a tigress, and of a young male tiger, possibly one of the cubs I had seen in April. The tigress had crossed and recrossed the Ladia a number of times during the last few days, and the previous night had walked along the strip of sand in front of our tent. It was this tigress that was suspected of being the man-eater, and as she had visited Sem repeatedly since the day the headman's mother had been killed, they were probably correct. <sighs> An examination of the pug marks of the tigress showed her as being an average-sized animal in the prime of life. Why she had become a man-eater would have to be determined later, but one of the reasons might have been that she had assisted to eat the victims of the chuka tiger when they were together the previous mating season, and having acquired a taste for human flesh, and no longer having a mate to provide her with it, had now turned a man-eater herself. This was only a surmise, and proved later to be incorrect. Before leaving Nainital, I had written to the Tassildar of Tanakpur and asked him to purchase four young male buffaloes for me and to send them to Sem. One of these buffaloes died on the road, the other three arrived on the 24th, and we tied them out the same evening together with the one MacDonald had given us. On going out to visit these animals next morning, I found the people of Chuka in a great state of excitement. The fields round the village had been recently ploughed, and the tigress, the previous night, had passed close to three families who were sleeping out on the fields with their cattle. Fortunately, in each case, the cattle had seen the tigress and warned the sleepers of her approach. After leaving the cultivated land, the tigress had gone up the track in the direction of Kotkindri and had passed close to two of our buffaloes without touching either of them. The Patwari, forest guards and villagers, had told us on our arrival at Sem that it would be a waste of time tying out our young buffaloes as they were convinced the man-eater would not kill them. The reason they gave was that this method of trying to shoot the man-eater had been tried by others without success, and that in any case, if the tigress wanted to eat buffaloes, there were many grazing in the jungles for her to choose from. In spite of this advice, however, we continued to tie out our buffaloes, and for the next two nights the tigress passed close to one or more of them without touching them. On the morning of the 27th, just as we were finishing breakfast, a party of men led by Tewari, the brother of the headman of Thak, arrived in camp and reported that a man of their village was missing. They stated that this man had left the village at about noon the previous day, telling his wife before leaving that he was going to see that his cattle did not stray beyond the village boundary, and as he had not returned, they feared he had been killed by the man-eater. Our preparations were soon made, and at ten o'clock the Ibbotsons and I set off for Thak, accompanied by Tewari and the men he had brought with him. The distance was only two miles, but the climb was considerable, and as we did not want to lose more time than we could possibly help, we arrived at the outskirts of the village, out of breath and in a lather of sweat. As we approached the village over the scrub-covered flat bit of ground, which I have reason to refer to later, we heard a woman crying. The wailing of an Indian woman mourning her dead is unmistakable, and on emerging from the jungle, we came on the mourner, the wife of the missing man, and some ten or fifteen men, 
who were waiting for us on the edge of the cultivated land. These people informed us that from their houses above, they had seen some white object, which looked like part of the missing man's clothing, in a field, overgrown with scrub, thirty yards from where we were now standing. Ibbotson, Tiwari, and I set off to investigate the white object, while Mrs. Ibbotson took the woman and the rest of the men up to the village. The field, which had been out of cultivation for some years, was covered with a dense growth of scrub, not unlike chrysanthemum, and it was not until we were standing right over the white object that Tiwari recognized it as the loincloth of the missing man. Near it was the man's cap. A struggle had taken place at this spot, but there was no blood. The absence of blood where the attack had taken place, and for some considerable distance along the drag, could be accounted for by the tigress's having retained her first hold, for no blood would flow in such a case until the hold had been changed. Thirty yards on the hill above us, there was a clump of bushes, roofed over with creepers. This spot would have to be looked at before following up the drag, for it was not advisable to have the tigress behind us. In the soft earth, under the bushes, we found the pug marks of the tigress, and where she had lain before going forward to attack the man. Returning to our starting point, we agreed on the following plan of action. Our primary object was to try to stalk the tigress and shoot her on her kill. To achieve this end, I was to follow the trail and at the same time keep a lookout in front with Tuari, who was unarmed, a yard behind me keeping a sharp lookout to right and left, and Ibbotson, a yard behind Tawari, to safeguard us against an attack from the rear. In the event of either Ibbotson or I seeing so much as a hair of the tigress, we were to risk a shot. Cattle had grazed over this area the previous day, disturbing the ground, and as there was no blood, and the only indication of the tigress's passage was an occasional turned-up leaf or crushed blade of grass, Progress was slow. After carrying the man for two hundred yards, the tigress had killed and left him, and had returned and carried him off several hours later, when the people of Thak had heard several Sambur calling in this direction. The reason for the tigress's not having carried the man away after she had killed him was possibly because his cattle may have witnessed the attack on him and driven her away. A big pool of blood had formed where the man had been lying, and as the blood from the wound in his throat had stopped flowing by the time the tigress had picked him up again, and further, as she was now holding him by the small of the back, whereas she had previously held him by the neck, tracking became even more difficult. The tigress kept to the contour of the hill, and as the undergrowth here was very dense and visibility only extended to a few yards, our advance was slowed down. In two hours, we covered half a mile, and reached a ridge beyond which lay the valley in which, six months previously, we had tracked down and killed the Chuka man-eater. On this ridge was a great slab of rock, which sloped upwards and away from the direction in which we had come. The tigress's tracks went down to the right of the rock, and I felt sure she was lying up under the overhanging portion of it, or in the close vicinity. Both Ibbotson and I had on light, rubber-soled shoes. Tiwari was barefooted, and we had reached the rock without making a sound. Signing to my two companions to stand still and keep a careful watch all round, I got a foothold on the rock and inch by inch went forward. Beyond the rock was a short stretch of flat ground, and as more of this ground came into view, I felt certain... My suspicion that the tigress was lying under the projection was correct. I had still a foot or two to go before I could look over, when I saw a movement to my left front. A goldenrod that had been pressed down had sprung erect, and a second later there was a slight movement in the bushes beyond, and a monkey in a tree on the far side of the bushes started calling. The tigress had chosen the spot for her after-dinner sleep with great care, but unfortunately for us, she was not asleep, and when she saw the top of my head, I had removed my hat, appearing over the rock. She had risen, and taking a step sideways, had disappeared under a tangle of blackberry bushes. Had she been lying anywhere but where she was, she could not have got away, 
no matter how quickly she had moved, without my getting a shot at her. Our so carefully carried out stalk had failed at the very last moment, and there was nothing to be done now but find the kill and see if there was sufficient of it left for us to sit up over. To have followed her into the blackberry thicket would have been useless, and would also have reduced our chance of getting a shot at her later. The tigress had eaten her meal close to where she had been lying, and as this spot was open to the sky and to the keen eyes of vultures, she had removed the kill to a place of safety where it would not be visible from the air. Tracking now was easy, for there was a blood trail to follow. The trail led over a ridge of great rocks, and fifty yards beyond these rocks we found the kill. I am not going to harrow your feelings by attempting to describe that poor, torn, and mangled thing, stripped of every stitch of clothing and atom of dignity, which only a few hours previously had been a man, the father of two children, and the breadwinner of that wailing woman who was facing, without any illusions, the fate of a widow of India. I have seen many similar sights, each more terrible than the one preceding it. In the thirty-two years I have been hunting man-eaters, and on each occasion I have felt that it would have been better to have left the victim to the slayer than recover a mangled mass of flesh to be a nightmare ever after to those who saw it. And yet the cry of blood for blood and the burning desire to rid a countryside of a menace than which there is none more terrible is irresistible. And then there is always the hope no matter how absurd one knows it to be, that the victim, by some miracle, may still be alive and in need of succor. The chance of shooting over a kill, an animal that has in all probability become a man-eater, through a wound received over a kill, is very remote, and each succeeding failure, no matter what its cause, tends to make the animal more cautious, until it reaches a state when it either abandons its kill after one meal, or approaches it as silently and as slowly as a shadow, scanning every leaf and twig with the certainty of discovering its would-be slayer, no matter how carefully he may be concealed, or how silent and motionless he may be. A one in a million chance of getting a shot, and yet, who is there among us who would not take it? The thicket into which the tigress had retired was roughly forty yards square, and she could not leave it without the monkey seeing her and warning us. So we sat down, back to back, to have a smoke and listen if the jungle had anything further to tell us while we considered our next move. To make a machan, it was necessary to return to the village, and during our absence the tigress was almost certain to carry away the kill. It had been difficult to track her when she was carrying a whole human being, but now, when her burden was considerably lighter and she had been disturbed, she would probably go for miles and we might never find her kill again. So it was necessary for one of us to remain on the spot, while the other two went back to the village for ropes. Ibbotson, with his usual disregard for danger, elected to go back and while he and Tawari went down the hill to avoid the difficult ground we had recently come over, I stepped up onto a small tree close to the kill. Four feet above ground, the tree divided in two, and by leaning on one half and putting my feet against the other, I was able to maintain a precarious seat which was high enough <laughs> off the ground to enable me to see the tigress if she approached the kill, and also high enough if she had any designs on me, to see her before she got to within striking distance. Ibbotson had been gone fifteen or twenty minutes when I heard a rock tilt forward and then back. The rock was evidently very delicately poised, and when the tigress had put her weight on it and felt it tilt forward, she had removed her foot and let the rock fall back into place. The sound had come from about twenty yards to my left front, the only direction in which it would have been possible for me to have fired without being knocked out of the tree. Minutes passed, each pulling my hopes down a little lower from the heights to which they had soared, and then, when tension on my nerves and the weight of the heavy rifle were becoming unbearable, I heard a stick snap at the upper end of the thicket. Here was an example of how a tiger can move through the jungle. From the sound she had made, I knew her exact position 
had kept my eyes fixed on the spot, and yet she had come, seen me, stayed some time watching me, and then gone away without my having seen a leaf or a blade of grass move. When tension on nerves is suddenly relaxed, cramped and aching muscles call loudly for ease, and though in this case it only meant the lowering of the rifle onto my knees to take the strain off my shoulders and arms, the movement, small though it was, sent a comforting feeling through the whole of my body. No further sound came from the tigress, and an hour or two later I heard Ibbotson returning. Of all the men I have been on Shikar with, Ibbotson is by far and away the best, for not only has he the heart of a lion, but he thinks of everything, and with it all is the most unselfish man that carries a gun. He had gone to fetch a rope, and he returned with rugs, cushions, more hot tea than even I could drink, and an ample lunch. And while I sat on the windward side of the kill to refresh myself, Ibbotson put a man in a tree forty yards away to distract the tigress's attention, and climbed into a tree overlooking the kill to make a rope machan. When the machan was ready, Ibbotson moved the kill a few feet, a very unpleasant job, and tied it securely to the foot of a sapling to prevent the tigresses carrying it away, for the moon was on the wane, and the first two hours of the night at this heavily wooded spot would be pitch dark. After a final smoke, I climbed onto the machan, and when I had made myself comfortable, Ibbotson recovered the man who was making a diversion and set off in the direction of Thack to pick up Mrs. Ibbotson and return to camp at Sem. The retreating party were out of sight, but were not yet out of sound when I heard a heavy body brushing against leaves, and at the same moment the monkey, which had been silent all this time, and which I could now see sitting in a tree on the far side of the blackberry thicket, started calling. Here was more luck than I had hoped for, and our ruse of putting a man up a tree to cause a diversion appeared to be working as successfully as it had done on a previous occasion. A tense minute passed, a second and a third, and then from the ridge, where I had climbed onto the big slab of rock, a caca came dashing down towards me, barking hysterically. The tigress was not coming to the kill, but had gone off after Ibbotson. I was now in a fever of anxiety, for it was quite evident that she had abandoned her kill and had gone to try to secure another victim. Before leaving... Ibbotson had promised to take every precaution, but on hearing the caca barking on my side of the ridge, he would naturally assume the tigress was moving in the vicinity of the kill, and if he relaxed his precautions, the tigress would get her chance. Ten very uneasy minutes for me passed, and then I heard a second caca barking in the direction of Thack. The tigress was still following, but the ground there was more open, and there was less fear of her attacking the party. The danger to the Ibbotsons was, however, not over by any means, for they had to go through two miles of very heavy jungle to reach camp, and if they stayed at Thack until sundown, listening for my shot, which I feared they would do, and which, as a matter of fact, they did do, they would run a very grave risk on the way down. Ibbotson fortunately realized the danger and kept his party close together, and though the tigress followed them the whole way, as her pug marks the following morning showed, they got back to camp safely. The calling of Kakar and Sambur enabled me to follow the movements of the tigress. An hour after sunset, she was down at the bottom of the valley two miles away. She had the whole night before her, and though there was only one chance in a million of her returning to the kill, I determined not to lose that chance. Wrapping a rug around me, for it was a bitterly cold night, I made myself comfortable in a position in which I could remain for hours without movement. I had taken my seat on the machan at 4 p.m., and at 10 p.m. I heard two animals coming down the hill towards me. It was too dark under the trees to see them, but when they got to the lee of the kill I knew they were porcupines. Rattling their quills, and making the peculiar booming noise that only a porcupine can make, they approached the kill and after walking round it several times, continued on their way. An hour later, and when the moon had been up some time, I heard an animal in the valley below. 
It was moving from east to west, and when it came into the wind blowing downhill from the kill, it made a long pause and then came cautiously up the hill. While it was still some distance away, I heard it snuffing the air and knew it to be a bear. The smell of blood was attracting him, but mingled with it was the less welcome smell of a human being. And taking no chances, he was very carefully stalking the kill. His nose, the keenest of any animals in the jungle, had apprised him while he was still in the valley that the kill was the property of a tiger. This to a Himalayan bear who fears nothing, and who will, as I have on several occasions seen, drive a tiger away from its kill, was no deterrent. But what was, and what was causing him uneasiness, was the smell of a human being. Mingled with the smell of blood and tiger. On reaching the flat ground, the bear sat down on his haunches a few yards from the kill, and when he had satisfied himself that the hated human smell held no danger for him, he stood erect and, turning his head, sent a long, drawn-out cry, which I interpreted as a call to a mate, echoing down into the valley. Then, without any further hesitation, he walked boldly up to the kill. And as he noted it, I aligned the sights of my rifle on him. I know of only one instance of a Himalayan bear eating a human being. On that occasion, a woman cutting grass had fallen down a cliff and been killed, and a bear finding the mangled body had carried it away and had eaten it. This bear, however, on whose shoulder my sights were aligned, appeared to draw the line at human flesh, and after looking at and smelling the kill. Continued his interrupted course to the west. When the sounds of his retreat died away in the distance, the jungle settled down to silence until interrupted a little after sunrise by Ibbotson's very welcome arrival. With Ibbotson came the brother and other relatives of the dead man, who very reverently wrapped the remains in a clean white cloth, and laying it on a cradle made of two saplings and rope, which Ibbotson provided. Set off for the burning on the banks of the Sada, repeating under their breath as they went the Hindu hymn of praise, Ram Nam Sat Hai, with its refrain Satya Bol Gat Hai. Fourteen hours in the cold had not been without its effect on me, but after partaking of the hot drink and food Ibbotson had brought, I felt none the worse for my long vigil. Two. After following the Ibbotsons down to Chuka on the evening of the twenty seventh, the Tigris, some time during the night, crossed the Ladia into the scrub jungle at the back of our camp. Through this scrub ran a path that had been regularly used by the villagers of the Ladia Valley until the advent of the Man Eater had rendered its passage unsafe. On the twenty eighth, the two mail runners who carried Ibbotson's duck on its first stage to Tanakpur got delayed in camp, and to save time, took, or more correctly, started to take a shortcut through this scrub. Very fortunately, the leading man was on the alert and saw the tigress as she crept through the scrub and lay down near the path ahead of them. Ibbotson and I had just got back from Thak when these two men dashed into camp, and taking our rifles, we hurried off to investigate. We found the pug marks of the tigress where she had come out on the path and followed the men for a short distance, but we did not see her. Though in one place where the scrub was very dense, we saw a movement and heard an animal moving off. On the morning of the twenty ninth, a party of men came down from Thak to report that one of their bullocks had not returned to the cattle shed the previous night, and on a search being made where it had last been seen, a little blood had been found. At two p.m., the Ibbotsons and I were at this spot, and a glance at the ground satisfied us that the bullock had been killed and carried away by a tiger. After a hasty lunch. Ibbotson and I, with two men following, carrying ropes for a machan, set out along the drag. It went diagonally across the face of the hill for a hundred yards, and then straight down into the ravine in which I had fired at and missed the big tiger in April. A few hundred yards down this ravine, the bullock, which was an enormous animal, had got fixed between two rocks, 
and not being able to move it, the tiger had eaten a meal off its hind quarters and left it. The pug marks of the tiger, owing to the great weight she was carrying, were splayed out, and it was not possible to say whether she was the man-eater or not, but as every tiger in this area was suspect, I decided to sit up over the kill. There was only one tree within reasonable distance of the kill, and as the men climbed into it to make a machan, the tiger started calling in the valley below. Very hurriedly, a few strands of rope were tied between two branches, and while Ibbotson stood on guard with his rifle, I climbed the tree and took my seat on what during the next fourteen hours proved to be the most uncomfortable, as well as the most dangerous machan I have ever sat on. The tree was leaning away from the hill, and from the three uneven strands of rope I was sitting on, there was a drop of over a hundred feet into the rocky ravine below. The tiger called several times as I was getting into the tree, and continued to call at longer intervals late into the evening, the last call coming from a ridge half a mile away. It was now quite evident that the tiger had been lying up close to the kill and had seen the men climbing into the tree. Knowing from past experience what this meant, she had duly expressed resentment at being disturbed and then gone away, for though I sat on the three strands of rope until Ibbotson returned next morning, I did not see or hear anything throughout the night. Vultures were not likely to find the kill, for the ravine was deep and overshadowed by trees, and as the bullock was large enough to provide the tiger with several meals, we decided not to sit up over it again, where it was now lying, hoping the tiger would remove it to some more convenient place, where we should have a better chance of getting a shot. In this, however, we were disappointed, for the tiger did not again return to the kill. Two nights later, the buffalo we had tied out behind our camp at Sem was killed, and through a little want of observation on my part, a great opportunity of bagging the man-eater was lost. The men who brought in the news of this kill reported that the rope securing the animal had been broken, and that the kill had been carried away up the ravine at the lower end of which it had been tied. This was the same ravine in which MacDonald and I had chased a tigress in April, and as, on that occasion, she had taken her kill some distance up the ravine, I now very foolishly concluded she had done the same with this kill. After breakfast, Ibbotson and I went out to find the kill and see what prospect there was for an evening sit-up. The ravine in which the buffalo had been killed was about fifty yards wide and ran deep into the foothills. For two hundred yards the ravine was straight, and then bent round to the left. Just beyond the bend, and on the left-hand side of it, there was a dense patch of young saplings, backed by a hundred-foot ridge, on which thick grass was growing. In the ravine, and close to the saplings, there was a small pool of water. I had been up the ravine several times in April, and had failed to mark the patch of saplings as being a likely place for a tiger to lie up in, and did not take the precautions I should have taken when rounding the bend, with the result that the tigress, who was drinking at the pool, saw us first. There was only one safe line of retreat for her, and she took it. This was straight up the steep hill, over the ridge, and into Sal Forest beyond. The hill was too steep for us to climb, so we continued on up the ravine to where a samba track crossed it, and following this track we gained the ridge. The tigress was now in a triangular patch of jungle, bounded by the ridge, the ladia, and a cliff down which no animal could go. The area was not large, and there were several deer in it, which from time to time advised us of the position of the tigress. But unfortunately, the ground was cut up by a number of deep and narrow rainwater channels, in which we eventually lost touch with her. We had not yet seen the kill, so we re-entered the ravine by the Samba track and found the kill hidden among the saplings. These saplings were from six inches to a foot in girth, and were not strong enough to support a machan, so we had to abandon the idea of a machan. With the help of a crowbar, 
A rock could possibly have been pried from the face of the hill and a place made in which to sit, but this was not advisable when dealing with a man-eater. Reluctant to give up the chance of a shot, we considered the possibility of concealing ourselves in the grass near the kill, in the hope that the tigress would return before dark and that we should see her before she saw us. There were two objections to this plan. A. If we did not get a shot, and the tigress saw us near her kill, she might abandon it, as she had done her other two kills. And B. Between the kill and camp, there was very heavy scrub jungle, and if we tried to go through this jungle in the dark, the tigress would have us at her mercy. So very reluctantly, we decided to leave the kill to the tigress for that night, and hope for the best on the morrow. On our return next morning, we found that the tigress had carried away the kill. For three hundred yards, she had gone up the bed of the ravine, stepping from rock to rock and leaving no drag marks. At this spot, three hundred yards from where she had picked up the kill, we were at fault, for though there were a number of tracks on a wet patch of ground, none of them had been made while she was carrying the kill. Eventually, after casting round in circles, we found where she had left the ravine and gone up the hill on the left. This hill, up which the tigress had taken her kill, was overgrown with ferns and goldenrod, and tracking was not difficult, but the going was, for the hill was very steep, and in places a detour had to be made, and the track picked up further on. After a stiff climb of a thousand feet, we came to a small plateau, bordered on the left by a cliff a mile wide. On the side of the plateau, nearest the cliff, the ground was seamed and cracked, and in these cracks a dense growth of sal, two to six feet in height, had sprung up. The tigress had taken her kill into this dense cover, and it was not until we actually trod on it that we were aware of its position. As we stopped to look at all that remained of the buffalo, there was a low growl to our right. With rifles raised, we waited for a minute, and then, hearing a movement in the undergrowth a little beyond where the growl had come from, we pushed our way through the young sow for ten yards and came on a small clearing where the tigress had made herself a bed on some soft grass. On the far side of this grass, the hill sloped upwards for twenty yards to another plateau, and it was from this slope that the sound we had heard had come. Proceeding up the slope as silently as possible, we had just reached the flat ground, which was about fifty yards wide, when the tigress left the far side and went down into the ravine, disturbing some caleach pheasants and a kakar as she did so. To have followed her would have been useless, so we went back to the kill, and, as there was still a good meal on it, we selected two trees to sit in, and returned to camp. After an early lunch, we went back to the kill, and, hampered with our rifles, climbed with some difficulty into the trees we had selected. We sat up for five hours without seeing or hearing anything. At dusk, we climbed down from our trees, and stumbling over the cracked and uneven ground, eventually reached the ravine when it was quite dark. Both of us had an uneasy feeling that we were being followed, but by keeping close together, we reached camp without incident at 9 p.m. The Ibbotsons had now stayed at Sem as long as it was possible for them to do so, and early next morning they set out on their twelve days' walk to keep their appointment at Ascot. Before leaving, Ibbotson extracted a promise from me that I would not follow up any kills alone, or further endanger my life by prolonging my stay at Sem for more than a day or two. After the departure of the Ibbotsons and their fifty men, the camp, which was surrounded by dense scrub, was reduced to my two servants and myself. My coolies were living in a room in the headman's house. So throughout the day I set all hands to collecting driftwood, of which there was an inexhaustible supply at the junction, to keep a fire going all night. The fire would not scare away the tigress, but it would enable us to see her if she prowled round our tents at night. And anyway, the nights were setting in cold, and there was ample excuse, if one were needed, for keeping a big fire going all night. Towards evening, when my men were safely back in camp, I took a rifle 
and went up the Ladia to see if the Tigris had crossed the river. I found several tracks in the sand, but no fresh ones, and at dusk I returned, convinced that the Tigris was still on our side of the river. An hour later, when it was quite dark, a caca started barking close to our tents and barked persistently for half an hour. My men had taken over the job of tying out the buffaloes, a task which Ibbotson's men had hitherto performed, and next morning I accompanied them when they went out to bring in the buffaloes. Though we covered several miles, I did not find any trace of the tigress. After breakfast, I took a rod and went down the junction and had one of the best days fishing I have ever had. The junction was full of big fish, and though my light tackle was broken frequently, I killed sufficient masseer to feed the camp. Again, as on the previous evening, I crossed the Ladia with the intention of taking up a position on a rock overlooking the open ground on the right bank of the river and watching for the Tigris to cross. As I got away from the roar of the water at the junction, I heard a samber and a monkey calling on the hill to my left, and as I neared the rock, I came on the fresh tracks of the Tigris. Following them back, I found the stones still wet where she had forded the river. A few minutes' delay in camp to dry my fishing line and have a cup of tea cost a man his life, several thousand men weeks of anxiety, and myself many days of strain. For though I stayed at Sam for another three days, I did not get another chance of shooting the tigress. On the morning of the 7th, as I was breaking camp and preparing to start on my twenty-mile walk to Tanakpur, a big contingent of men from all the surrounding villages arrived and begged me not to leave them to the tender mercies of the man-eater, giving them what advice it was possible to give people situated as they were, I promised to return as soon as it was possible for me to do so. I caught the train at Tanakpur next morning and arrived back in Nainital on November 9th, having been away nearly a month. 3. I left Sem on the 7th of November, and on the 12th the Tigris killed a man at Thak. I received news of this kill through the divisional forest officer, Haldwani, shortly after we had moved down to our winter home at the foot of the hills. And by doing forced marches, I arrived at Chuka a little after sunrise on the 14th. It had been my intention to breakfast at Chuka and then go on to Thak and make that village my headquarters. But the headman of Thak, whom I found installed at Chuka, informed me that every man, woman, and child had left Thak immediately after the man had been killed on the 12th and added that if I carried out my intention of camping at Thak, I might be able to safeguard my own life, but it would not be possible to safeguard the lives of my men. This was quite reasonable, and while waiting for my men to arrive, the headman helped me to select a site for my camp at Chuka, where my men would be reasonably safe, and I should have some privacy from the thousands of men who were now arriving to fell the forest. On receipt of the divisional forest officer's telegram acquainting me of the kill, I had telegraphed to the Tassildar at Tanakpur to send three young male buffaloes to Chuka. My request had been promptly complied with, and the three animals had arrived the previous evening. After breakfast, I took one of the buffaloes and set out for Thak, intending to tie it up on the spot where the man had been killed on the twelfth. The headman had given me a very graphic account of the events of that date, for he himself had nearly fallen a victim to the tigress. It appeared that towards the afternoon, accompanied by his granddaughter, a girl ten years of age, he had gone to dig up ginger tubers in a field some sixty yards from his house. This field is about half an acre in extent, and is surrounded on three sides by jungle and being on the slope of a fairly steep hill, it is visible from the headman's house. After the old man and his granddaughter had been at work for some time, his wife, who was husking rice in the courtyard of the house, called out in a very agitated voice, and asked him if he was deaf that he could not hear the pheasants and other birds that were chattering in the jungle above him. Fortunately for him, he acted promptly. Dropping his hoe, 
He grabbed the child's hand, and together they ran back to the house, urged on by the woman who said she could now see a red animal in the bushes at the upper end of the field. Half an hour later, the tigress killed a man who was lopping branches off a tree in a field, three hundred yards from the headman's house. From the description I had received from the headman, I had no difficulty in locating the tree. It was a small, gnarled tree growing out of a three-foot-high bank between two terraced fields, and had been lopped year after year for cattle fodder. The man who had been killed was standing on the trunk holding one branch and cutting another, when the tigress came up from behind, tore his hold from the branch, and, after killing him, carried him away into the dense brushwood bordering the fields. Thak village was a gift from the Chandrajas, who ruled Kumaon for many hundreds of years before the Gurkha occupation, to the forefathers of the present owners in return for their services at Punagiri temples. The promise made by the Chandrajas that the lands of Thak and two other villages would remain rent-free for all time has been honored by the British government for a hundred years. From a collection of grass huts, the village has in the course of time grown into a very prosperous settlement with masonry houses roofed with slate tiles, for not only is the land very fertile, but the revenue from the temples is considerable. Like all other villages in Kumaon, Thak during its hundreds of years of existence has passed through many vicissitudes, but never before in its long history had it been deserted as it now was. On my previous visits, I had found it a hive of industry, but when I went up to it on this afternoon, taking the young buffalo with me, silence reigned over it. Every one of the hundred or more inhabitants had fled, taking their livestock with them. The only animal I saw in the village was a cat, which gave me a warm welcome. So hurried had the evacuation been that many of the doors of the houses had been left wide open. On every path in the village, in the courtyard of the houses, and in the dust before all the doors, I found the tigress's pug marks. The open doorways were a menace, for the path as it wound through the village passed close to them, and in any of the houses the tigress may have been lurking. On the hill, thirty yards above the village, were several cattle shelters, and in the vicinity of these shelters I saw more Kalish pheasants, red jungle fowl, and white-capped babblers than I have ever before seen, and from the confiding way in which they permitted me to walk among them, it is quite evident that the people of Thak have a religious prejudice against the taking of life. From the terraced fields above the cattle shelters, a bird's-eye view of the village is obtained, and it was not difficult, from the description the headman had given me, to locate the tree where the tigress had secured her last victim. In the soft earth, under the tree, there were signs of a struggle and a few clots of dried blood. From here, the tigress had carried her kill a hundred yards over a ploughed field, through a stout hedge, and into the dense brushwood beyond. The footprints from the village and back the way they had come showed that the entire population of the village had visited the scene of the kill, but from the tree to the hedge there was only one track, the track the tigress had made when carrying away her victim. No attempt had been made to follow her up and recover the body. Scraping away a little earth from under the tree, I exposed a root, and to this root I tied my buffalo, bedding it down with a liberal supply of straw taken from a nearby haystack. The village, which is on the north face of the hill, was now in shadow, and if I was to get back to camp before dark, it was time for me to make a start. Skirting round the village to avoid the menace of the open doorways, I joined the path below the houses. This path, after it leaves the village, passes under a giant mango tree, from the roots of which issues a cold spring of clear water. After running along a groove cut in a massive slab of rock, this water falls into a rough masonry trough from where it spreads onto the surrounding ground, rendering it soft and slushy. I had drunk at the spring on my way up, leaving my footprints in this slushy ground, and on approaching the spring now for a second drink, I found the tigress's pug marks superimposed on my footprints. After quenching her thirst, 
the tigress had avoided the path and had gained the village by climbing a steep bank overgrown with scrobilanthes and nettles, and taking up a position in the shelter of one of the houses, had possibly watched me while I was tying up the buffalo, expecting me to return the way I had gone. It was fortunate for me that I had noted the danger of passing those open doorways a second time, and had taken the longer way round. When coming up from Chuka, I had taken every precaution to guard against a sudden attack, and it was well that I had done so, for I now found from her pug marks that the tigress had followed me all the way up from my camp, and next morning, when I went back to Thack, I found she had followed me from where I had joined the path below the houses, right down to the cultivated land at Chuka. Reading with the illumination I had brought with me was not possible, so after dinner that night, while sitting near a fire, which was as welcome for its warmth as it was for the feeling of security it gave me, I reviewed the whole situation and tried to think out some plan by which it would be possible to circumvent the tigress. When leaving home on the 22nd, I had promised that I would return in ten days, and that this would be my last expedition after man-eaters. Years of exposure and strain and long absences from home, extending, as in the case of the Shogar tigress and the Rudra Priag leopard, to several months on end, were beginning to tell as much on my constitution as on the nerves of those at home. And if by the 30th of November I had not succeeded in killing this man-eater, others were found who were willing to take on the task. It was now the night of the 24th, so I had six clear days before me. Judging from the behavior of the tigress that evening, she appeared to be anxious to secure another human victim, and it should not therefore be difficult for me, in the time at my disposal, to get in touch with her. There were several methods by which this could be accomplished, and each would be tried in turn. The method that offers the greatest chance of success of shooting a tiger in the hills is to sit up in a tree over a kill. And if, during that night, the tigress did not kill the buffalo I had tied up at Thack, I would, the following night, and every night thereafter, tie up the other two buffaloes in places I had already selected. And, failing to secure a human kill, it was just possible that the tigress might kill one of my buffaloes, as she had done on a previous occasion when the Ibbotsons and I were camped at Sam in April. After making up the fire with logs that would burn all night, I turned in, and went to sleep listening to a caca barking in the scrub jungle behind my tent. While breakfast was being prepared the following morning, I picked up a rifle and went out to look for tracks on the stretch of sand on the right bank of the river, between Chuka and Sem. The path, after leaving the cultivated land, runs for a short distance through scrub jungle, and here I found the tracks of a big male leopard, possibly the same animal that had alarmed the Kaka the previous night. A small male tiger had crossed and recrossed the Ladia many times during the past week, and in the same period the man-eater had crossed only once, coming from the direction of Sem. A big bear had traversed the sand a little before my arrival, and when I got back to camp, the timber contractors complained that while distributing work that morning, they had run into a bear which had taken up a very threatening attitude, in consequence of which their labor had refused to work in the area in which the bear had been seen. Several thousand men, the conductors put the figure at 5,000, had now concentrated at Chuka and Kumeyachak to fell and saw up the timber and carry it down to the motor road that was being constructed. And all the time this considerable labor force was working, they shouted at the tops of their voices to keep up their courage. The noise in the valley, resulting from axe and saw, the crashing of giant trees down the steep hillside, the breaking of rocks with sledgehammers, and combined with it all, the shouting of thousands of men can better be imagined than described. That there were many and frequent alarms in this nervous community was only natural, and during the next few days I covered much ground and lost much valuable time in investigating false rumors of attacks and kills by the man-eater.
for the dread of the Tigris was not confined to the Ladia Valley, but extended right down the Sarda through Kaldunga to the Gorge, an area of roughly fifty square miles, in which an additional ten thousand men were working. That a single animal should terrorize a labor force of these dimensions, in addition to the residents of these surrounding villages, and the hundreds of men who were bringing foodstuffs for the laborers, or passing through the valley with hill produce in the way of oranges, purchasable at twelve annas a hundred, walnuts and chilies to the market at Tanakpur, is incredible, and would be unbelievable were it not for the historical and nearly parallel case of the man-eaters of Savo, where a pair of lions, operating only at night, held up work for long periods on the Uganda Railway. To return to my story, breakfast disposed of on the morning of the 25th, I took a second buffalo and set out for Thak. The path, after leaving the cultivated land at Chuka, skirts along the foot of the hill for about half a mile before it divides. One arm goes straight up a ridge to Thak, and the other, after continuing along the foot of the hill for another half mile, zigzags up through Kumeachak to Kotkindri. At the divide, I found the pug marks of the Tigris, and followed them all the way back to Thak. The fact that she had come down the hill after me the previous evening was proof that she had not killed the buffalo. This, though very disappointing, was not at all unusual for tigers will on occasions visit an animal that is tied up for several nights in succession before they finally kill it, for tigers do not kill unless they are hungry. Leaving the second buffalo at the mango tree, where there was an abundance of green grass, I skirted round the houses and found number one buffalo sleeping peacefully after a big feed and a disturbed night. The tigress, coming from the direction of the village, as her pug marks showed, had approached to within a few feet of the buffalo, and had then gone back the way she had come. Taking the buffalo down to the spring, I let it graze for an hour or two, and then took it back and tied it up at the same spot where it had been the previous night. The second buffalo I tied up fifty yards from the mango tree, and at the spot where the wailing woman and villagers had met us the day the Ibbotsons and I had gone up to investigate the human kill. Here a ravine a few feet deep crossed the path, on one side of which there was a dry stump, and on the other an almond tree in which a machan could be made. I tied number two buffalo to the stump and bedded it down with sufficient hay to keep it going for several days. There was nothing more to be done at Thack, so I returned to camp, and, taking the third buffalo, crossed the Ladia and tied it up behind Sem, in the ravine where the tigress had killed one of our buffaloes in April. At my request, the Tassildar of Tanakpur had selected three of the fastest young male buffaloes he could find— all three were now tied up in places frequented by the Tigris, and as I set out to visit them on the morning of the 26th, I had great hopes that one of them had been killed, and that I should get an opportunity of shooting the Tigris over it. Starting with the one across the Ladia, I visited all in turn, and found that the Tigris had not touched any of them. Again, as on the previous morning, I found her tracks on the path leading to Thack, but on this occasion there was a double set of pug marks, one coming down and the other going back. On both her journeys, the tigress had kept to the path and had passed within a few feet of the buffalo that was tied to the stump, fifty yards from the mango tree. On my return to Chuka, a deputation of Thack villagers, led by the headman, came to my tent and requested me to accompany them to the village to enable them to replenish their supply of foodstuffs. So at midday, followed by the headman and his tenants, and by four of my own men, carrying ropes for a machan and food for me, I returned to Thak and mounted guard while the men hurriedly collected the provisions they needed. After watering and feeding the two buffaloes, I retied number two to the stump, and took number one half a mile down the hill, and tied it to a sapling on the side of the path. I then took the villagers back to Chuka, and returned a few hundred yards up the hill for a scratch meal while my men were making the machan.
It was now quite evident that the tigress had no fancy for my fat buffaloes, and as in three days I had seen her tracks five times on the path leading to Thack, I decided to sit up over the path and try to get a shot at her that way. To give me warning of the tigress's approach, I tied a goat with a bell round its neck on the path, and at 4 p.m. I climbed into the tree. I told my men to return at 8 a.m. the following morning, and began my watch. At sunset, a cold wind started blowing, and while I was attempting to pull a coat over my shoulders, the ropes on one side of the machan slipped, rendering my seat very uncomfortable. An hour later, a storm came on, and though it did not rain for long, it wet me to the skin, greatly adding to my discomfort. During the sixteen hours I sat in the tree, I did not see or hear anything. The men turned up at 8 a.m., I returned to camp for a hot bath and a good meal, and then, accompanied by six of my men, set out for Thack. The overnight rain had washed all the old tracks off the path, and two hundred yards above the tree I had sat in, I found the fresh pug marks of the tigress, where she had come out of the jungle and gone up the path in the direction of Thack. Very cautiously, I stalked the first buffalo, only to find it lying asleep on the path. The tigress had skirted round it, rejoined the path a few yards further on, and continued up the hill. Following on her tracks, I approached the second buffalo, and as I got near the place where it had been tied, two blue Himalayan magpies rose off the ground and went screaming down the hill. The presence of these birds indicated a that the buffalo was dead, b that it had been partly eaten and not carried away, and c that the tigress was not in the close vicinity. On arrival at the stump to which it had been tied, I saw that the buffalo had been dragged off the path and partly eaten, and on examining the animal, I found it had not been killed by the tigress, but that it had, in all probability, died of snake bite. There were many hamadryads in the surrounding jungles, and that, finding it lying dead on the path, the tigress had eaten a meal off it and had then tried to drag it away. When she found she could not break the rope, she had partly covered it over with dry leaves and brushwood, and continued on her way up to Thack. Tigers, as a rule, are not carrion eaters, but they do, on occasions, eat animals they themselves have not killed. For instance, on one occasion, I left the carcass of a leopard on a fire track, and when I returned next morning to recover a knife I had forgotten, I found that a tiger had removed the carcass to a distance of a hundred yards and eaten two-thirds of it. On my way up from Chuka, I had dismantled the machan I had sat on the previous night, and while two of my men climbed into the almond tree to make a seat for me, the tree was not big enough for a machan, the other four went to the spring to fill a kettle and boil some water for tea. By 4 p.m. I had partaken of a light meal of biscuits and tea, which would have to keep me going until next day, and refusing the men's request to be permitted to stay the night in one of the houses in back, I sent them back to camp. There was a certain amount of risk in doing this, but it was nothing compared to the risk they would run if they spent the night in back. My seat on the tree consisted of several strands of rope tied between two upright branches, with a couple of strands lowered down for my feet to rest on. When I had settled down comfortably, I pulled the branches round me and secured them in position with a thin cord, leaving a small opening to see and fire through. My hide was soon tested, for shortly after the men had gone, the two magpies returned and attracted others, and nine of them fed on the kill until dusk. The presence of the birds enabled me to get some sleep, for they would have given me warning of the tigress's approach, and with their departure my all-night vigil started. There was still sufficient daylight to shoot by when the moon, a day off the full, rose over the Nepal hills behind me and flooded the hillside with brilliant light. The rain of the previous night had cleared the atmosphere of dust and smoke, and after the moon had been up a few minutes, the light was so good that I was able to see a samber and her young one feeding in a field of wheat 
a hundred and fifty yards away. The dead buffalo was directly in front and about twenty yards away, and the path along which I expected the tigress to come was two or three yards nearer, so I should have an easy shot at a range at which it would be impossible to miss the tigress, provided she came, and there was no reason why she should not do so. The moon had been up two hours, and the samber had approached to within fifty yards of my tree when a kakar started barking on the hill just above the village. The kakar had been barking for some minutes when suddenly a scream, which I can only very inadequately describe as Arr, 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 dying away on a long, drawn out note, came from the direction of the village. So sudden, and so unexpected had the scream been, that I involuntarily stood up with the intention of slipping down from the tree and dashing up to the village, for the thought flashed through my mind that the man-eater was killing one of my men. Then, in a second flash of thought, I remembered I had counted them one by one as they had passed my tree, and that I had watched them out of sight on their way back to camp to see if they were obeying my instructions to keep close together. The scream had been the despairing cry of a human being in mortal agony, and reason questioned how such a sound could have come from a deserted village. It was not a thing of my imagination, for the kakar had heard it and had abruptly stopped barking, and the samber had dashed away across the fields, closely followed by her young one. Two days previously, when I had escorted the men to the village, I had remarked that they appeared to be very confiding to leave their property behind doors that were not even shut or latched, and the headman had answered that even if their village remained untenanted for years, their property would be quite safe, for they were priests of Punagiri, and no one would dream of robbing them. He added that as long as the tigress lived, she was a better god of their property, if god were needed, than any hundred men could be, for no one in all that countryside would dare to approach the village for any purpose through the dense forests that surrounded it, unless by me as they had been. The screams were not repeated, and as there appeared to be nothing that I could do, I settled down again on my rope seat. At ten p.m., a kakar that was feeding on the young wheat crop at the lower end of the fields dashed away barking, and a minute later the tigress called twice. She had now left the village and was on the move, and even if she did not fancy having another meal off the buffalo, there was every hope of her coming along the path which she had used twice every day for the past few days. With finger on trigger, and eyes straining on the path, I sat hour after hour, until daylight succeeded moonlight, and when the sun had been up an hour, my men returned. Very thoughtfully, they had brought a bundle of dry wood with them, and in a surprisingly short time, I was sitting down to a hot cup of tea. The tigress may have been lurking in the bushes close to us, or she may have been miles away, for after she had called at ten p.m., the jungles had been silent. When I got back to camp, I found a number of men sitting near my tent. Some of these men had come to inquire what luck I had had the previous night, and others had come to tell me that the tigress had called from midnight to a little before sunrise at the foot of the hill, and that all the laborers engaged in the forests and on the new export road were too frightened to go to work. I had already heard about the tigress from my men, who had informed me that, together with the thousands of men who were camped round Chuka, they had sat up all night to keep big fires going. Among the men collected near my tent was the headman of Thak, and when the others had gone, I questioned him about the kill at Thak on the twelfth of the month, when he so narrowly escaped falling a victim to the man-eater. Once again, the headman told me in great detail how he had gone to his fields to dig ginger, taking his grandchild with him, and how, on hearing his wife calling, he had caught the child's hand and run back to the house, where his wife had said a word or two to him about not keeping his ears open, and thereby endangering his own and the child's life, and how a few minutes later the tigress had killed a man while he was cutting leaves off a tree in a field above his house. 
All this part of the story I had heard before, and I now asked him if he had actually seen the tigress killing the man. His answer was no, and he added that the tree was not visible from where he had been standing. I then asked him how he knew that the man had been killed, and he said because he had heard him. In reply to further questions, he said the man had not called for help, but had cried out. And when asked if he had cried out once, he said, no, three times. And then, at my request, he gave an imitation of the man's cry. It was the same, but a very modified rendering, as the screams I had heard the previous night. I then told him what I had heard, and asked him if it was possible for anyone to have arrived at the village accidentally, and his answer was an emphatic negative. There were only two paths leading to Thak, and every man, woman, and child in the villages through which these two paths passed knew that Thak was deserted, and the reason for its being so. It was known throughout the district that it was dangerous to go near Thak in daylight, and it was therefore quite impossible for anyone to have been in the village at eight o'clock the previous night. When asked if he could give any explanation for screams having come from a village in which there could not, according to him, have been any human beings, his answer was that he could not. And, as I can do no better than the headman, it were best to assume that neither the Kakar, the Sambur, nor I heard those very real screams, screams of a human being in mortal agony. 4. When all my visitors, including the headman, had gone, and I was having breakfast, my servant informed me that the headman of Sem had come to the camp the previous evening, and had left word for me that his wife, while cutting grass near the hut where his mother had been killed, had come on a blood trail, and that he would wait for me near the ford over the Ladia in the morning. So, after breakfast, I set out to investigate this trail. While I was fording the river, I saw four men hurrying towards me, and as soon as I was on dry land, they told me that when they were coming down the hill above Sem, they had heard a tiger falling across the valley on the hill between Chuka and Thak. The noise of the water had prevented my hearing the call. I told the men that I was on my way to Sem and would return to Chuka shortly and left them. The headman was waiting for me near his house, and his wife took me to where she had seen the blood trail the previous day. The trail, after continuing along a field for a short distance, crossed some big rocks, on one of which I found the hairs of a caca. A little further on I found the pug marks of a big male leopard, and while I was looking at them, I heard a tiger call. Telling my companions to sit down and remain quiet, I listened in order to locate the tiger. Presently, I heard the call again, and thereafter it was repeated at intervals of about two minutes. It was the tigress calling, and I located her as being five hundred yards below Thak and in the deep ravine, which, starting from the spring under the mango tree, runs parallel to the path, and crosses it at its junction with the Kumeachak path. Telling the headman that the leopard would have to wait to be shot at a more convenient time, I set off as hard as I could go for camp, picking up at the ford the four men who were waiting for my company to Chuka. On reaching camp, I found a crowd of men round my tent, most of them sawyers from Delhi, but including the petty contractors, agents, clerks, timekeepers, and gangmen of the financier who had taken up the timber and road construction contracts in the Ladia Valley. These men had come to see me in connection with my stay at Chuka. They informed me that many of the hillmen carrying timber and working on the road had left for their homes that morning, and that if I left Chuka on December 1st, as they had heard I intended doing, the entire labor force, including themselves, would leave on the same day. For already they were too frightened to eat or sleep, and no one would dare to remain in the valley after I had gone. It was then the morning of November 29th, and I told the men that I still had two days and two nights, and that much could happen in that time, 
but that in any case it would not be possible for me to prolong my stay beyond the morning of the first. The tigress had by now stopped calling, and when my servant had put up something for me to eat, I set out for Thack, intending, if the tigress called again and I could locate her position, to try to stalk her, and if she did not call again, to sit up over the buffalo. I found her tracks on the path and saw where she had entered the ravine, and though I stopped repeatedly on my way up to Thack and listened, I did not hear her again. So, a little before sunset, I ate the biscuits and drank the bottle of tea I had brought with me, and then climbed into the almond tree and took my seat on the few strands of rope that had to serve me as a machan. On this occasion, the magpies were absent, so I was unable to get the hour or two's sleep the birds had enabled me to get the previous evening. If a tiger fails to return to its kill the first night, it does not necessarily mean that the kill has been abandoned. I have, on occasions, seen a tiger return on the tenth night and eat what could no longer be described as flesh. On the present occasion, however, I was not sitting over a kill, but over an animal that the tigress had found dead and off which she had made a small meal. And had she not been a man-eater, I would not have considered the chance of her returning the second night good enough to justify spending a whole night in a tree when she had not taken sufficient interest in the dead buffalo to return to it the first night. It was, therefore, with very little hope of getting a shot that I sat on the tree from sunset to sunrise, and though the time I spent was not as long as it had been the previous night, my discomfort was very much greater, for the ropes I was sitting on cut into me, and a cold wind that started blowing shortly after moonrise and continued throughout the night chilled me to the bone. On this second night I heard no jungle or other sounds, nor did the Samber and her young one come out to feed on the fields. As daylight was succeeding moonlight, I thought I heard a tiger call in the distance, but could not be sure of the sound or of its direction. When I got back to camp, my servant had a cup of tea and a hot bath ready for me, but before I could indulge in the latter, my forty-pound tent was not big enough to bathe in, I had to get rid of the excited throng of people who were clamoring to tell me their experiences of the night before. It appeared that shortly after moonrise, the tigress had started calling close to Chuka, and after calling at intervals for a couple of hours, had gone off in the direction of the labor camps at Kumeachak. The men in these camps, hearing her coming, started shouting to try to drive her away, but so far from having this effect, the shouting only infuriated her the more, and she demonstrated in front of the camps until she had cowed the men into silence. Having accomplished this, she spent the rest of the night between the labor camps and Chuka, daring all and sundry to shout at her. Towards morning she had gone away in the direction of Thack, and my informants were surprised and very disappointed that I had not met her. This was my last day of man-eater hunting, and though I was badly in need of rest and sleep, I decided to spend what was left of it in one last attempt to get in touch with the tigress. The people, not only of Chuka and Sem, but of all the surrounding villages, and especially the men from Taladez, where some years previously I had shot three man-eaters, were very anxious that I should try sitting up over a live goat. For, said they, all hill tigers eat goats, and as you have had no luck with buffaloes, why not try a goat? More to humor them than with any hope of getting a shot, I consented to spend this last day in sitting up over the two goats I had already purchased for this purpose. I was convinced that no matter where the tigress wandered to at night, her headquarters were at back. So at midday, taking the two goats and accompanied by four of my men, I set out for Thack. The path from Chuka to Thak, as I have already mentioned, runs up a very steep ridge. A quarter of a mile on this side of Thak, the path leaves the ridge and crosses a more or less flat bit of ground which extends right up to the mango tree. 
For its whole length across this flat ground, the path passes through dense brushwood and is crossed by two narrow ravines which run east and join the main ravine. Midway between these two ravines, and a hundred yards from the tree I had sat in the previous two nights, there is a giant almond tree. This tree had been my objective when I left camp. The path passes right under the tree, and I thought that if I climbed halfway up, not only should I be able to see the two goats, one of which I intended tying at the edge of the main ravine, and the other at the foot of the hill to the right, but I should also be able to see the dead buffalo. As all three of these points were at some distance from the tree, I armed myself with an accurate two seventy five rifle, in addition to the four fifty four hundred rifle, which I took for an emergency. I found the climb up from Chuka on this last day very trying, and I had just reached the spot where the path leaves the ridge for the flat ground when the tigress called about a hundred and fifty yards to my left. The ground here was covered with dense undergrowth and trees interlaced with creepers, and was cut up by narrow and deep ravines, and strewn over with enormous boulders, a very unsuitable place in which to stalk a man eater. However, before deciding on what action I should take, it was necessary to know whether the tigress was lying down, as she very well might be, for it was then one p.m or whether she was on the move, and if so, in what direction. So, making the men sit down behind me, I listened, and presently the call was repeated. She had moved some fifty yards, and appeared to be going up the main ravine in the direction of Thack. This was very encouraging, for the tree I had selected to sit in was only fifty yards from the ravine. After enjoining silence on the men, and telling them to keep close behind me, we hurried along the path. We had about two hundred yards to go to reach the tree, and had covered half the distance, when, as we approached a spot where the path was bordered on both sides by dense brushwood, a covey of Kalish pheasants rose out of the brushwood and went screaming away. I knelt down and covered the path for a few minutes, but as nothing happened, we went cautiously forward and reached the tree without further incident. As quickly and as silently as possible, one goat was tied at the edge of the ravine, while the other was tied at the foot of the hill to the right. Then I took the men to the edge of the cultivated land and told them to stay in the upper veranda of the headman's house until I fetched them and ran back to the tree. I climbed to a height of forty feet and pulled the rifle up after me with a cord I had brought for the purpose. Not only were the two goats visible from my seat, one at a range of seventy and the other at a range of sixty yards, but I could also see part of the buffalo, and as the two seventy five rifle was very accurate, I felt sure I could kill the tigress if she showed up anywhere on the ground I was overlooking. The two goats had lived together ever since I had purchased them on my previous visit, and being separate now, were calling lustily to each other. Under normal conditions, a goat can be heard at a distance of four hundred yards, but here the conditions were not normal, for the goats were tied on the side of a hill down which a strong wind was blowing, and even if the tigress had moved after I had heard her, it was impossible for her not to hear them. If she was hungry, as I had every reason to believe she was, there was a very good chance of my getting a shot. After I had been on the tree for ten minutes, a caca barked near the spot the pheasants had risen from. For a minute or two, my hopes rose sky high, and then dropped back to earth, for the caca barked only three times and ended on a note of inquiry. Evidently there was a snake in the scrub, which neither he nor the pheasants liked the look of. My seat was not uncomfortable, and the sun was pleasingly warm, so for the next three hours I remained in the tree without any discomfort. At four p.m. the sun went down behind the high hill above Thack, and thereafter the wind became unbearably cold. For an hour I stood the discomfort, and then decided to give up for the cold had brought on an attack of ague, and if the tigress came now, it would not be possible for me to hit her. I retied the cord to the rifle and let it down, climbed down myself, and walked to the edge of the cultivated land, 
to call up my men. Five. There are a few people, I imagine, who have not experienced that feeling of depression that follows failure to accomplish anything they have set out to do. The road back to camp after a strenuous day when the chucker hill partridge bag is full is only a step compared with the same road which one plods over mile after weary mile when the bag is empty. And if this feeling of depression has ever assailed you at the end of a single day, and when the quarry has only been chucker, you will have some idea of the depth of my depression that evening when, after calling up my men and untying the goats, I set off on my two-mile walk to camp. For my effort had been not of a single day, or my quarry a few birds, nor did my failure concern only myself. Excluding the time spent on the journeys from and to home, I had been on the heels of the man-eater from October 23rd to November 7th, and again from the 14th to the 30th of November, and it is only those of you who have walked in fear of having the teeth of a tiger meet in your throat who will have any idea of the effect on one's nerves of days and weeks of such anticipation. Then again, my quarry was a man-eater, and my failure to shoot it would very gravely affect everyone who was working in or whose homes were in that area. Already work in the forests had been stopped, and the entire population of the largest village in the district had abandoned their homes. Bad as the conditions were, they would undoubtedly get worse if the man-eater was not killed, for the entire labor force could not afford to stop work indefinitely, nor could the population of the surrounding villages afford to abandon their homes and their cultivation as the more prosperous people of Thak had been able to do. The tigress had long since lost her natural fear of human beings, as was abundantly evident from her having carried away a girl, picking up mangoes in a field close to where several men were working, killing a woman near the door of her house, dragging a man off a tree in the heart of a village, and the previous night cowing a few thousand men into silence. And here was I who knew full well what the presence of a man-eater meant to the permanent and to the temporary inhabitants and to all the people who passed through the district on their way to the markets at the foothills or the temples at Punagiri, plodding down to camp on what I had promised others would be my last day of man-eater hunting. Reason enough for a depression of soul which I felt would remain with me for the rest of my days. Gladly at that moment... Would I have bartered the success that had attended thirty-two years of man-eater hunting for one unhurried shot at the tigress? I have told you of some of the attempts I made during this period of seven days and seven nights to get a shot at the tigress, but these were by no means the only attempts I made. I knew that I was being watched and followed, and every time I went through the two miles of jungle between my camp and Thak, I tried every trick I have learnt in a lifetime spent in the jungles to outwit the tigress. Bitter though my disappointment was, I felt that my failure was not in any way due to anything I had done or left undone. 6. My men, when they rejoined me, said that an hour after the kaka had barked, they had heard the tigress calling a long way off but were not sure of the direction. Quite evidently, the tigress had as little interest in goats as she had in buffaloes, but even so, it was unusual for her to have moved at that time of day from a locality in which she was thoroughly at home, unless she had been attracted away by some sound which neither I nor my men had heard. However that may have been, it was quite evident that she had gone, and as there was nothing further that I could do... I set off on my weary tramp to camp. The path, as I have already mentioned, joins the ridge that runs down to Chuka a quarter of a mile from Thak, and when I now got to this spot, where the ridge is only a few feet wide, and from where a view is obtained of the two great ravines that run down to the Ladia River, 
I heard the tigress call once and again across the valley on my left. She was a little above and to the left of Kumeachak, and a few hundred yards below the Kut Kindry Ridge, on which the men working in that area had built themselves grass shelters. Here was an opportunity, admittedly forlorn and unquestionably desperate, of getting a shot. Still, it was an opportunity, and the last I should ever have, and the question was whether or not I was justified in taking it. When I got down from the tree, I had one hour in which to get back to camp before dark. Calling up the men, hearing what they had to say, collecting the goats and walking to the ridge had taken about thirty minutes, and judging from the position of the sun, which was now casting a red glow on the peaks of the Nepal hills, I calculated I had roughly half an hour's daylight in hand. This time factor or perhaps it would be more correct to say light factor, was all important, for if I took the opportunity that offered, on it would depend the lives of five men. The tigress was a mile away, and the intervening ground was densely wooded, strewn over with great rocks and cut up by a number of deep nullahs, but she could cover the distance well within the half hour, if she wanted to. The question I had to decide was whether or not I should try to call her up. If I called, and she heard me, and came while it was still daylight, and gave me a shot, all would be well. On the other hand, if she came and did not give me a shot, some of us would not reach camp, for we had nearly two miles to go, and the path the whole way ran through heavy jungle, and was bordered in some places by big rocks, and in others by dense brushwood. It was useless to consult the men. For none of them had ever been in a jungle before coming on this trip, so the decision would have to be mine. I decided to try to call up the tigress. Handing my rifle over to one of the men, I waited until the tigress called again, and, cupping my hands round my mouth and filling my lungs to their utmost limit, sent an answering call over the valley. Back came her call, and thereafter, for several minutes, Call answered call. She would come, had in fact already started, and if she arrived while there was light to shoot by, all the advantages would be on my side, for I had the selecting of the ground on which it would best suit me to meet her. November is the mating season for tigers, and it was evident that for the past forty-eight hours she had been rampaging through the jungles in search of a mate, and that now, on hearing what she thought was a tiger answering her mail, she would lose no time in joining him. For four hundred yards down the ridge, the path runs for fifty yards across a flat bit of ground. At the far right-hand side of this flat ground, the path skirts a big rock and then drops steeply and continues in a series of hairpin bends down to the next bench. It was at this rock I decided to meet the tigress and on my way down to it, I called several times to let her know I was changing my position, and also to keep in touch with her. I want you now to have a clear picture of the ground in your mind to enable you to follow the subsequent events. Imagine, then, a rectangular piece of ground forty yards wide and eighty yards long, ending in a more or less perpendicular rock face. The path coming down from Thack runs on to this ground at its short or south end, and after continuing down the centre for twenty-five yards, bends to the right and leaves the rectangle on its long or east side. At the point where the path leaves the flat ground, there is a rock about four feet high. From a little beyond, where the path bends to the right, a ridge of rock, three or four feet high, rises and extends to the north side of the rectangle, where the ground falls away in a perpendicular rock face. On the near or path side of this low ridge, there is a dense line of bushes approaching to within ten feet of the four-foot-high rock I have mentioned. The rest of the rectangle is grown over with trees, scattered bushes, and short grass. It was my intention to lie on the path by the side of the rock and shoot the tigress as she approached me. But when I tried this position, I found it would not be possible for me to see her until she was within two or three yards. 
and further, that she could get at me either round the rock or through the scattered bushes on my left without my seeing her at all. Projecting out of the rock from the side opposite to that from which I expected the tigress to approach, there was a narrow ledge. By sitting sideways, I found I could get a little of my bottom on the ledge, and by putting my left hand flat on the top of the rounded rock and stretching out my right leg to its full extent and touching the ground with my toes, retain my position on it. The men and goats I placed immediately behind, and ten to twelve feet below me. The stage was now set for the reception of the tigress, who, while these preparations were being made, had approached to within three hundred yards. Sending out one final call to give her direction, I looked round to see if my men were all right. The spectacle these men presented would, under other circumstances, have been ludicrous, but was here tragic. Sitting in a tight little circle, with their knees drawn up and their heads together, with the goats burrowing in under them, they had that look of intense expectancy on their screwed-up features that one sees on the faces of spectators waiting to hear a big gun go off. From the time we had first heard the tigress from the ridge, neither the men nor the goats had made a sound beyond one suppressed cough. They were probably by now frozen with fear, as well they might be. And even if they were, I take my hat off to those four men who had the courage to do what I, had I been in their shoes, would not have dreamt of doing. For seven days they had been hearing the most exaggerated and blood-curdling tales of this fearsome beast that had kept them awake the past two nights, and now, while darkness was coming on, and sitting unarmed in a position where they could see nothing, they were listening to the man-eater drawing nearer and nearer. Greater courage and greater faith it is not possible to conceive. The fact that I could not hold my rifle a DB-450-400, with my left hand, which I was using to retain my precarious seat on the ledge, was causing me some uneasiness, for apart from the fear of the rifles slipping on the rounded top of the rock, I had folded my handkerchief and placed the rifle on it to try to prevent this, I did not know what would be the effect of the recoil of a high-velocity rifle fired in this position. The rifle was pointing along the path in which there was a hump, and it was my intention to fire into the tigress's face immediately when she appeared over this hump, which was twenty feet from the rock. The tigress, however, did not keep to the contour of the hill, which would have brought her out on the path a little beyond the hump, but crossed a deep ravine and came straight towards where she had heard my last call, at an angle which I can best describe as one o'clock. This maneuver put the low ridge of rock, over which I could not see, between us. She had located the direction of my last call with great accuracy, but had misjudged the distance, and not finding active mate at the spot she had expected him to be, she was now working herself up into a perfect fury, and you will have some idea of what the fury of a tigress in her condition can be when I tell you that not many miles from my home a tigress on one occasion closed a public road for a whole week, attacking everything that attempted to go along it, including a string of camels, until she was finally joined by a mate. I know of no sound more liable to fret one's nerves than the calling of an unseen tiger at close range. What effect this appalling sound was having on my men, I was frightened to think, and if they had gone screaming down the hill, I should not have been at all surprised, for even though I had the heel of a good rifle to my shoulder and the stock against my cheek, I felt like screaming myself. But even more frightening than this continuous calling was the fading out of the light. Another few seconds, ten or fifteen at the most, and it would be too dark to see my sights, and we should then be at the mercy of a man-eater, plus a tigress wanting a mate. Something would have to be done, and done in a hurry, if we were not to be massacred, and the only thing I could think of was to call. The tigress was now so close that I could hear the intake of her breath each time before she called and as she again filled her lungs, 
I did the same with mine, and we called simultaneously. The effect was startlingly instantaneous. Without a second's hesitation, she came tramping with quick steps through the dead leaves, over the low ridge, and into the bushes a little to my right front. And just as I was expecting her to walk right on top of me, she stopped. And the next moment, the full blast of her deep-throated call struck me in the face and would have carried the hat off my head had I been wearing one. A second's pause, then again, quick steps. A glimpse of her as she passed between two bushes, and then she stepped right out into the open and, looking into my face, stopped dead. By great and unexpected good luck, the half-dozen steps the tigress took to her right front carried her almost to the exact spot at which my rifle was pointing. Had she continued in the direction in which she was coming before her last call, my story, if written, would have had a different ending, for it would have been as impossible to slew the rifle on the rounded top of the rock as it would have been to lift and fire it with one hand. Owing to the nearness of the tigress and the fading light, all that I could see of her was her head. My first bullet caught her under the right eye, and the second, fired more by accident than with intent, took her in the throat, and she came to with her nose against the rock and knocked me off the ledge, and the recoil from the left barrel, fired while I was in the air, brought the rifle up in violent contact with my jaw and sent me heels overhead right on top of the men and goats. Once again, I take my hat off to those four men. For, not knowing but what the tigress was going to land on them next, they caught me as I fell, and saved me from injury and my rifle from being broken. When I had freed myself from the tangle of human and goat legs, I took the two seventy five rifle from the man who was holding it, rammed a clip of cartridges into the magazine, and sent a stream of five bullets singing over the valley and across the Sada into Nepal. Two shots to the thousands of men in the valley and in the surrounding villages who were anxiously listening for the sound of my rifle might mean anything, but two shots followed by five more, spaced at regular intervals of five seconds, could only be interpreted as conveying one message, and that was that the man-eater was dead. I had not spoken to my men from the time we had first heard the tigress from the ridge. On my telling them now that she was dead, and that there was no longer any reason for us to be afraid, they did not appear to be able to take in what I was saying. So I told them to go up and have a look while I found and lit a cigarette. Very cautiously, they climbed up to the rock, but went no further, for, as I have told you, the tigress was touching the other side of it. Late in camp that night, while sitting round a campfire and relating their experiences to relays of eager listeners, their narrative invariably ended up with... And then the tiger, whose roaring had turned our livers into water, hit the sahib on the head and knocked him down on top of us. And if you don't believe us, go and look at his face. Amira is superfluous in camp, and even if I had had one, it could not have made the swelling on my jaw, which put me on milk diet for several days, look as large and as painful as it felt. By the time a sapling had been felled, and the tigress lashed to it, lights were beginning to show in the Ladia Valley and in all the surrounding camps and villages. The four men were very anxious to have the honour of carrying the tigress to camp, but the task was beyond them, so I left them and set off for help. In my three visits to Chuka during the past eight months, I had been along this path many times by day, and always with a loaded rifle in my hands and now I was stumbling down in the dark, unarmed, my only anxiety being to avoid a fall. If the greatest happiness one can experience is the sudden cessation of great pain, then the second greatest happiness is undoubtedly the sudden cessation of great fear. One hour previously, it would have taken wild elephants to have dragged from their homes and camps the men who now, singing and shouting, were converging from every direction, singly and in groups, on the path leading to Thak. Some of the men of this rapidly growing crowd went up the path to help carry in the tigress, 
while others accompanied me on my way to camp, and would have carried me had I permitted them. Progress was slow, for frequent halts had to be made to allow each group of new arrivals to express their gratitude in their own particular way. This gave the party carrying the tigress time to catch us up, and we entered the village together. I will not attempt to describe the welcome my men and I received, or the scenes I witnessed at Chuka that night, for having lived the greater part of my life in the jungles, I have not the ability to paint word pictures. A hayrick was dismantled, and the tigress laid on it, and an enormous bonfire made from driftwood close at hand to light up the scene and for warmth, for the night was dark and cold, with a north wind blowing. Round about midnight, my servant, assisted by the headman of Thak and Kunwar Singh, near whose house I was camped, persuaded the crowd to return to their respective villages and labor camps, telling them they would have ample opportunity of feasting their eyes on the tigress the following day. Before leaving himself, the headman of Thak told me he would send word in the morning to the people of Thak to return to their village. This he did, and two days later, the entire population returned to their homes and have lived in peace ever since. After my midnight dinner, I sent for Kunwa Singh and told him that in order to reach home on the promised date, I should have to start in a few hours, and that he would have to explain to the people in the morning why I had gone. This he promised to do, and I then started to skin the tigress. Skinning a tiger with a pocket knife is a long job, but it gives one an opportunity of examining the animal that one would otherwise not get. And in the case of man-eaters, enables one to ascertain, more or less accurately, the reason for the animal's having become a man-eater. The tigress was a comparatively young animal, and in the perfect condition one would expect her to be at the beginning of the mating season. Her dark winter coat was without a blemish, and in spite of her having so persistently refused the meals I had provided for her, she was encased in fat. She had two old gunshot wounds, neither of which showed on her skin. The one in her left shoulder, caused by several pellets of homemade buckshot, had become septic, and when healing the skin over quite a large surface, had ed permanently to the flesh. To what extent this wound had incapacitated her, it would have been difficult to say, but it had evidently taken a very long time to heal, and could quite reasonably have been the cause of her having become a man-eater. The second wound, which was in her right shoulder, had also been caused by a charge of buckshot, but had healed without becoming septic. These two wounds, received over kills in the days before she had become a man-eater, were quite sufficient reason for her not having returned to the human and other kills I had sat over. After having skinned the tigress, I bathed and dressed, and though my face was swollen and painful, and I had twenty miles of rough going before me, I left Chuka walking on air, while the thousands of men in and around the valley were peacefully sleeping. I have come to the end of the jungle stories I set out to tell you, and I have also come near the end of my man-eater hunting career. I have had a long spell and count myself fortunate in having walked out on my own feet and not been carried out on a cradle in the manner and condition of the man of Thack. There have been occasions when life has hung by a thread, and others when a light purse and disease resulting from exposure and strain have made the going difficult, but for all these occasions I am amply rewarded if my hunting has resulted in saving one human life.